So we're going to be in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 10 to 12. I believe the Lord is going to speak something to us today, and uh, I pray that we, we respond in honor. So in honor of God's word, let's read, and we're going to pray and um, go into his word today. So 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 10 to 12. Actually, we're going to start a little bit early over at um, halfway through verse 10. It says there, Yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more, and to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. You should mind your own business and work with your hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders, and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. T turn to me a little bit more towards Matthew. We're, we're going to read a few more verses, if that's okay. We're going to be in Matthew 5, verse, or sorry, Matthew 6, verses 1 to 6, and we're going to jump over to 16 as well. So let me get in there and see if, sorry, things are moving a little bit here so I can get some slides. Here we go. Matthew 6, verse 1 to 6. Hopefully you can see it there. It says there, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward." But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who is in secret will reward you. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward, but when you pray, Go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. We're going to jump over to verse 16 here. Lastly, it says, When you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Praise be the name of the Lord. Um, uh, tech people, if you could uh, slide. I think my, my system here is not working. But I want to speak to you today about this simple phrase that says, can you keep a secret? Can you, t can you look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, can you keep a secret? I know we're all Filipinos here. It's a little bit hard for us to talk about secrets here. We're a bit, what do you call Marites. And uh, so for all the Marites out there, can you keep a secret? <laughs> I don't know if you understand that. But let's pray and let's ask the Lord to help us in this word today. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that we are here today. Lord, we thank you for the breath that you have given our lungs, Father God, the day, the morning, the sunshine, the seasons, Lord. And Father, as we come here today, Lord, we know that there are so many distractions, Father God, in our life, worries, anxieties. But what right now, Father God, we just pray that let your word speak to us, Father God. May we hear your Holy Spirit, Lord. I anoint, Father God, our minds, our ears. Lord, anoint my lips, Father God, as I deliver your word. And we pray, Holy Spirit, today that you join us, Lord, and make this a revelation, Father God, in our hearts that we may change, Father God, and become more like you. We invite you, Holy Spirit. Thank you for your dear presence. We love you, Abba, in Jesus' name, Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. And again, my system here is not working, so Gian, thank you for uh, <laughs> being, uh, being really good at what you do. But anybody here go to the gym? No? Yes? It's February, by the way. If, uh, if for those of you who don't know, we are done one month out of 2024. How fast is that? It's February. What is it? February 4? Oh, man. Ten more days before the dreaded day 
for singles and looking. <laughs> but it's February, and if you don't know, for most people who, um, you know, who go into the year, I think for, for, for some of us, or for most of us, isn't it true that some of us set, set some goals, right? Anybody here set some goals that I'm going to get, you know, going to get fit, lose a bit of weight? You know that 80% of people who set goals in January lose it by February, Right? I don't know about you, but uh, I've had a membership at, uh, at YMCA. I, I, I don't call it a membership. It's more of like a charity. You know, I, I donate money to the gym. But, <laughs> but I go to, I don't know, not because, you know, not because I'm good or, you know, I like the gym. It's, it's because I need, you know, I, I need it. Uh, but for the most part, I'm, I'm kind of giving them more money than I, I am losing weight. So I'm losing more money than I am losing weight. But that's okay. So I go, to, I go to this gym, and it's interesting, and, and I, I, don't, I know I don't look like it, but I'm getting there. You know, it's, it's a process. It's been seven years, so I don't know how long, how long the process is, but someday. But anyway, I go to this gym, and it's called the YMCA. Have anybody here heard the YMCA? Great gym. I mean, it's a great place. It's not just a gym. There's a basketball court. There's a, you know, there's... Any Y, y members here? No? It's, you should. It's, it's a really, it's, a, it's, by the way, it's a Christian organization, by the way. It was started by Christians back in, I think, the, the 1800s or the, sorry, 1900s. But it's a great organization. It's just located just by, you know, the city center. Uh, great place. They have a swimming pool. They have a basketball court. They have programs for children. That's why I like it there. There's so many things going on. And there's so many people that you can meet. But I go there once in a while to use their gym, you know, weightlifting, um, you know, I don't really do the weightlifting stuff there, but it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a great place to really be in shape, you know. But one thing I do like about the YMCA, which is, which is kind of odd because uh, for all other gyms, for those of you who go, who go to the gym, I don't know if Enoch is here. Um, I'm not sure if you've been to a gym before, but you sometimes in, in the gym, right, you'd see people taking photos. <laughs> and like, you know, flexing a little bit, you know. Um, you know, posting it and saying like, yeah, look, you know, gym day today, and, and, and that's cool, especially if you look good. And I can't do that because, you know, there's really nothing to post. But what I like about the YMCA is that they have this no photo rule. So you can't take photos when you're, when you're gym. I guess it's for privacy, you know, because there's, there's also a lot of old people who are, uh, who are at the gym. Um, so even privacy and stuff like that. So they, they, you can't take pictures. I mean, you could use your phone to listen to you know, the, uh, you know, their music or whatever. But they have this post that I saw that's hanging on their wall. And it says this. I, 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 thought, I thought it was kind of cheesy, but at the same time, it was, like, was, was kind of nice. I was going to take a picture of it, but you can't take photos in the gym. So I just wrote it down. It says there, no photos allowed when working out here. Just let your body's work show it loud and clear. Hmm. What does that mean? I mean, I was like, oh, well, that's kind of cheesy. But at the same time, it's like, that is true, right? For the re sometimes the reason we, we take photos or we kind of like post stuff is we want everybody to know, right? We want to be loud about the things that we do. But, but the why or YMCA says, and, it, and they say it there, you know, you don't need to post, you know, your process or your progress. Let your body of work show it loud and clear. Is that amen? I'm not saying that, you know, don't, don't post. Don't post. I, but what, you don't have anything to show. But anyway, but isn't it true as well in our Christian life? Right? That for the most part, we tend to post or say or tell about the things that we do more than us showing it. I remember there's this quote, and it's not really referenced well, but Francis of Assisi said um, that, Preach the gospel, and if necessary, use words. What does he mean when he says that? Or what does that quote mean? It just means that, you know what, as much as it's good to preach and talk and, and tell about the, the, you know, the gospel, it is also important that we actually show it. Amen? Do we get it? It's sometimes we're, we're so used to like, you know, I'm going to share this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sh show something that I'm doing. I'm going to talk about, you know, I'm so focused on preaching or talking or saying, or even let's say, especially in this world of social media, posting, which is I'm not against posting, by the way, though. You could, you know, I, I feel blessed when people post and I, I encourage everybody as well. If there's something that the Lord is speaking to you, share it. You know, share it. We have a group chat and most of the time people would post testimonies, verses, quiet times, and that's encouraging. But if we're not careful, you know, that practice of exposing the things that we do in the public so often 
can deprive us of the power that God wants for us. Amen? That we're more focused on what does the world have to say about what I'm going to say. Right? Versus what, what, what does God really want to speak to me? Because every time we read something, you know, I mean, I've, I've had this, this situation before where you read something, oh, that's so good. Let me take a picture of it. I'm going to share it to everybody. And then a few, a few minutes, a few hours later, how many likes did I get? How many people see my posts? Whereas God is saying like, hey, this is just for you. There's no need to share it. There's no need to show it. And for most of us, especially the young generation, you know, we, we want to be, we have this kind of ambition that we want to be a voice, right? We want to be used by God to speak. Right? But really in our generation right now, and what I, pray, uh, what I pray for is that I hope and pray that we have a generation who is not more than just a voice, right? but more of an example of the gospel of Jesus. Right? And when we look at what Paul is saying here in, in, in the next slide, it says in 1 Thessalonians there, he said this, look, it says, Yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more, and to make it what? To make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, to lead a quiet life. Is that your ambition? Is that your godly ambition? To say, Lord, I just want to live a quiet life. Or do you want to live a loud life where people see you or people see us and see what we're doing and how good we are and how talented we are? And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. God gave us gifts to show to the world. But is there something here that Paul is saying? To lead and live a quiet life. And if you look at Jesus, this is, he's, he's the perfect example of this, in, um, of living a quiet and peaceful life. Does anybody here know, and, and who's, who here is, uh, the, the prime time of your life usually is in your early or mid-20s. Anybody here in their like, early 20s? By the way, welcome back, Carlo. I think uh, it's nice to see you again. He's been out for uh, how long? Like two months? On vacation, it's just nice to see. It's like he's, like, we're living life at a certain age, right? When you're young, you go travel, you, you have so much energy. And at a certain age too, once you're finished school and you started working, now you have a little bit more money and you can spend. You don't have responsibilities yet with, with children. So you have like what you call your prime life, right? Sometime in the early 20s, 23. Anybody here 23? 23 years old. Jules? No, 32. I think you should be opposite. 23 or 32. <laughs> 23 years old, right? Ali, how old are you, Ali? 24, 25? But you're like, you're in your prime years, right? 23 years old. I can remember when I was 23. Oh, man, like the things that you can do, like the money that you can earn, right? But does anybody here know what Jesus was doing when he was 23? What was he doing when he was 23? Nothing, right? Well, not nothing. He's doing something. We just don't know what it is, right? He's, we know he's a carpenter at 23, Right? It says in the word that he grew up as a carpenter. And when you reach a little bit old, you go a little bit older, let's say you're 25, right? You have so much more money, so much more energy. But do we know what Jesus was doing when he was 25? Nothing. Like, well, we don't know what he's doing. Well, he know, we know he's a carpenter. He's probably a better carpenter at 25. How about 27? Anybody here 27? Think Daddy just turned 27. So again, you have so much vibrancy, right? It's the peak of your life. But yet, what was Jesus doing when he was 27? We don't know. Well, we probably know he's a better carpenter, right? <laughs> he's probably done a good amount of experience. Maybe 10 years, 12 years. And it's if as is Jesus, right? He's, it looks like his goal for his life is to, leave, to live a quiet life when nobody knows what he was doing. And it's funny. Jesus was born in a place called Nazareth. Or sorry, is it Nazareth? Or better? Yeah, Nazareth where nobody knows. And I think if you were here for Pastor Phyllis preaching, nobody cares about Nazareth. It's that, up, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shout out a, a, a city here, but I'm not gonna, I don't want to offend anybody. But anyway, like, when you live in a certain town where nobody knows where it is, like why would Jesus, the Son of God, the one who was sent to proclaim the gospel throughout the world, born and lived in a place where nobody knows? Could it be that Jesus was developing what you call a quiet life? He was just waiting for the time when God was going to start using him. And I said, he was working really good with his hands. He was a carpenter. Is there a reason Jesus chose to be a carpenter? Because he was trying to be good with, what his, with, with his hand. Amen? And for us, is this the ambition that we have? Do we have the life that's, that's like Jesus? Or we have the life wherein we want to attract the crowd? 
We want to be out there. And it's so easy for us to do it now. Why? Because we have access to a computer, a phone. Right? It's so easy to show the world what we are doing. But Jesus invites us into a life where we know, you know what? This is not the life that I want for you. I want you to have a quiet life. Right? And we can see it all the time when Jesus was, you know, and, and we can see it in Scripture multiple times that Jesus, when he was living and he was when, even when he was ministering, most of the time Jesus was not chasing a crowd. Why? The crowd was chasing Jesus, but what was Jesus trying to do? He was trying to run away from the crowd. Right? There's multiple times in the Bible where the crowd was trying to look for Jesus and Jesus was out. He was out secluded in a solitary place. He was doing his hardest to detach and remove himself from the crowd. Why? Could it be that there is power in the secret place? Could it be that the pursuit of spirituality or the, the pursuit of a good life is in a place where there is a secret and that's what we're going to look at today. And even when Jesus, when he was growing up, uh, or he was, uh, he was talking about this, he says this in Matthew 6. And by the way, this is in the middle of um, the Beatitudes. I'm not sure if you've seen it before or if you've read it, but the Beatitudes consist of Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And right in the middle of the Beatitudes, Jesus was teaching. And this is his big sermon. This is the Sermon on the Mount. Um, Jesus was teaching us what does it look like to live an ambitious life. And this is what Jesus said. It says it, it says it here, beware of practicing your righteousness before others. Or beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. Beware of it. Hide your righteousness. You don't have to show your righteousness. Right? We don't, at least you don't have to speak about it or you have to talk about your righteousness. He says, hide your righteousness. But here's the interesting thing about this, this teaching of Jesus. Aside from the fact that he's, he's, he's warning us about, about talking about or sharing our righteousness, he does talk about practices, right? He did mention that there are certain practices that we have to do, right? And when we say practices, it's the things that we have to actually do, because for, for most of us, we think that, you know, what, what do we actually do as a Christian? Well, Jesus says there are certain practices that I want you to do as a Christian. I just don't want you to talk about them. And right now, we're going to talk about three specific practices and the principles behind these practices that gives us the power to really live the life that God wants us to live. So are you with me? Just three quick things, and I hope this helps us understand, like, Lord, these are the practices that you want me to actually do. But I really want to understand, Lord, how do I do this so that you will be glorified? So the first practice that we're going to talk about quickly here is this practice of giving. Giving. Jesus says here in Matthew 6, verse 1 again, it says, Thus, when you give to the needy, giving. Anybody here have, that, have practiced this term, giving? How's your giving life? Have you been giving more or have you been taking more? Giving, giving is in the core of the teaching of Jesus. Did you know that the gospel, the core of the gospel is giving? Why? John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Giving is at the core of the Christian practice. And if we as Christians have not been giving, we really have to ask God, God, am I really following you? Have I really been transformed by the gospel? Because God, you gave yourself to me. Have I been giving to others? I received you, God, as my Lord and Savior through Jesus Christ. But out of that giving that you have done, am I giving back to those who are in need? See, again, I think uh, Father has been, uh, has been uh, talking about like, it's like the tax, you know, the tax, uh, tax season is over, right? And by the way, if you haven't given Tita Evelyn your... Uh, your um, Sorry, your address, please do so. We could reimburse your, or we could, you could give out your, uh, your, your taxes for the end of the year. But when he talks about giving, usually at the end of the year, I'm not sure for those of us who are older and dealing with our taxes, there's a part in our taxes where, you know, an accountant or a financial advisor would say, how much have you given today or this year? Why? Because usually when you give or you give to charity or nonprofits, right, you get a little bit of a, what do you call like a tax cut, right? And you know that's why big companies, they give a lot. Why? Because they get cut a lot too. 
right? Because, because big companies that are, that are spending a lot of money, the reason that they give to charity is not because they're good and they're nice and they're, they're loving, and some of them are due. It's, it's mainly because they're going to get a cut from the tax that the government's going to charge them for the end of the year. And I can see it right now. For most of you, when I talk about money, we start like, oh, man. Either we start getting afraid, sometimes we get sleepy. And so my, my wife, whenever we talk about the budget, you know, she starts, she starts yawning. But, but, you know, money is hard. It's, it's hard to talk about money, amen? Well, I mean, it's very personal, right? It's like, ah, oh, you know, you can talk about Jesus, but don't talk about money. And by the way, this is not a prosperity church, by the way. <laughs> so, you know, we're talking about giving, not taking. But, but giving is core to the practice of Jesus. So how is your giving? How was your giving last year? How's your giving this year? And, and uh, I remember this. I'm just going to teach something really quick here. And, and my, my financial advisor friends will be happy with me. But have you ever heard about this 50-20-30 rule for finances? Have you ever heard this before? This is just a simple rule that we may want to follow, especially for the young people who are earning some money. This is some perspective on how, do I, how am I supposed to spend my money so that I can be wise? And there's something, uh, and yeah, this is not from the Bible, but this is something that is, that is practical for us to learn. There's something called the 50, 20, 30 rule. And this is what this means is that this is how you split or you um, I'll say allocate or budget the money that you are receiving. Anybody here who's working? Can you please raise your hand? Any, anybody here receiving a paycheck? Everyone? Well, I think there's not a lot of people working today, but <laughs> you're here. Okay, well, for those of you who are earning, this is some, a, a, a rule that you may want to apply in your, in your life, and it's something that will help you be more wise with your money. So the 50-20 rule states that 50% of your income, minus the taxes, remove your taxes, and what is it called, Go, uh, gross or net? 50% um, of what you take home, what goes into your bank, has to go to your needs. When we talk about needs, what are needs? It's just essentially your housing, your car, your commute, groceries, gas, bills, insurance. These are the things that puts a roof in your head. Make sure that your family is secured. 50%. Think about your budget right now. How much am I spending on my needs? 50%. So if you're earning, I don't know, let's say $4,000 a month just for easy math, $2,000 needs to go to your needs. And you're like, like, I'm in Canada. Like, rent is like $3,000 for one bedroom. <laughs> but here's the thing. Yeah, if you are spending more than 50% for your needs, chances are you are way beyond your means of living. I know it's hard right now, especially with the economy. But the rule of thumb is that 50% of your income needs to go to things that will keep you alive. Your house, your clothes, your food. And if not, maybe you have to cut back. Maybe you're living beyond your means. So 50%. Amen. People are starting like writing numbers. How much is my budget today? Look at your budget. 50% needs to go to your needs. Now, 20%. Again, Tita Evelyn, Tita Carol, Carol would, like, would, uh, would love me here. But 50%, 20% of your income needs to go to your savings. It's like, oh man, like, I, I, like my savings is like negative 20%. <laughs> Why? Because you're securing your future. It's just wisdom, right? We never know what's going to happen, right? Saving is very important. And the Bible says that as well, that, you know, wisdom, you know, if you save money, and again, not, not too many, because you don't want to, like, you know, invest in everything, you know, with, with what God has given you. But the idea here is that be wise with your money. 20% goes to savings, right? RSPs, TFSAs, RSPs, MNMA, I don't know, all these words, <laughs> And if you don't know what to talk about, talk, about, talk to a financial advisor. But 20% of your income needs to go to savings. And by the way, here's another part that needs to go to your savings. Put it in some sort of an emergency fund. Does anybody here have an emergency fund? An emergency fund means that if something bad happens, I have something to pull out from. Right? Put some sort of money in some sort of a savings plan. Put it under your or emergency fund. fund. You can put it under your bed. You can put it in a savings account. But save at least something. There's, there's a uh, survey says here that North Americans, 80% of North Americans don't even have $1,000 set on their savings account or some sort of an emergency fund. You know, tires break, win you need to buy winter tires. I just bought winter tires like a few weeks ago and there's no more snow. I feel so bad. I'm like trying to see why. <laughs> That's my emergency fund. But anyway, I'm trying to see if I can sell it. If anybody wants to buy winter tires, I'm selling mine because there's no more snow. But... Emergency fund, savings, right? And then lastly, again, 50, 20, 30 rule. And lastly, 30% goes to your wants. 
we call it discretionary money, which means that you know if you want to buy something or you want to you know do something, thirty percent goes to that. That's you know that's your clothes, going out, and things like that. So that's that's it's a lot. It's a it's a big part, right? Thirty percent, right? So if you have again, if you have if you earn four thousand dollars a month, that's like what twelve hundred something like that. It's still a lot of money every month. Um, but here's the thing: if you're a Christian, we know this, and this is very important. If you're a Christian, you already know that that part is where you get your tithes. It's not from your needs. It's not from your savings. It's from your wants. Why? Because it's sacrificial, right? You're not, and again, in God's wisdom, he's not asking you to be poor. Well, for some of us, he does. But, but it's, he's not asking you to, you know, to take out stuff from your house or from your savings. He's asking it to give it sacrificially to the things that you want. So tithes and offering. Again, tithes just means it's 10%. And you give it to the Lord uh, as an act of faith, saying, God, you gave me 100%. I get to keep 90. And I, can, I, I give you 10% as a part of your kingdom. And for some of us, like, oh, Lord, 10% is so big. Like, we look at that small amount, like 10%, God, that's, that's a huge amount. That's my, my, you know, my, my payment for my car or, you know, going out. And God said, I gave you 90. I gave you 90. And you can't even give 10%. But anyway, so that leaves us with what? 20%. We have 20 more percent to use. I know it's a little bit of math. But here's the thing. Out of that 20%, do you have something saved up to give? And we're not talking about giving to the church or giving to the... And Jesus says here, giving, giving to the needy. Do we allocate budget or money to people who are in need? Because at the core of the gospel... You know that, that, that certain terms, when Jesus talks about giving here, he's not just saying about giving money. The word give that Jesus used here is, is an encompassing word that encompasses words like generosity, hospitality, charity. You know those words, the word hospitality or the word hospital came from the Christian movement? You know that hospitals came from the, from the way or the people who are following Jesus? That back in the day, there were no such thing as a hospital. Right? You have to go for a physician. You have to go to a doctor who specializes in something to heal you. But the Christians, Christians who were following Jesus back in the first century, what they did is that they created houses. So they would have houses where they just intake people who are sick. And soon enough, that, that, that house where people would always go to get sick, and even people who are not Christians would go to a Christian house because they know that there's people in there who's going to care for them. There's a doctor who does things for free. And sooner or later, that house was called a hospital. That's where the, where the word hospitality comes from. And the word hospitality means that you are inviting a stranger into your house. And that's what a hospital means. It's our strangers looking for medical attention. So the core of Christianity is hospitality, charity, giving, generosity. And we cannot be followers of Jesus if we do not have the heart to give. And my suggestion is, same as savings and everything else, put aside money. So that you are ready to give when the, when the need comes. Right? I remember there's this, um, this old mentor, friends of ours. We, they didn't tell us about this story. Somebody else who, who are friends of them as well. They're an old couple. Um, they're friends of them who told us this story. He said, like, you know what? You know, this, this so-and-so, I remember when I was in need and I was at their place. And we were just all t- t- talking about this. And there was a time where she couldn't pay her rent or she couldn't pay her bills anymore. And she was just there. She wasn't, you know, she was going to ask for anything. And they, they come up to, when they were praying for her, you know, the, the couple who was praying for her, um, they were praying for her for, for some reason. There was a speaking of the Spirit that said to the man, he said, I feel that the Spirit saying to me that you need payment for your rent today. And the rent wasn't cheap. It was like, I think, over $2,000. So after the prayer, he goes to the back of his room, picks up a jar with cash in it, Gives it to her and said, the Lord said, he wants me to give this to you. And she's like, and then when she counted it, you know how much it was? It's exactly at the amount that she needed for rent. Exactly the amount. And she's like, how did you come up with this money? Where did this come from? And, and he's like, you know, no, we, we, we always, every time we would, you know, every week we would do Shabbat. And at, at Shabbat, we would, always, we would always give to this jar, saying that, Lord, anytime the need arises, we could give this to someone. And he said, for so, for so long, because it's been a pandemic, we had no visitors. We had no way to give this. So it ke- kept growing and growing. And then you came, and God said, give this to someone. See, that's the spirit of the gospel, where we're free to give. And what if we could save an amount 
from our income and say, Lord, this is for somebody who is going to be in need. What would that do? Right? It's like, it's crazy hospitality, crazy generosity. So, giving. A principle that God or a practice that God wants us or Jesus is asking us to do. Are you still with me? Amen. Are we, are we encouraged to give? Yeah, let's be faithful, not just in our tithes and our offering, but to help one another, to give to one another. Save up. Just as you do for savings for your future, save up for somebody who will be in need in the future. Because that's how we demonstrate the gospel, is giving. But the principle behind giving that's more important than the actual giving itself is what? Is we do it in secret. Jesus said again and again, hide your righteous deeds. Right? For the most part, when you give somebody to someone, you know, I, I can see I'm, I'm on LinkedIn all the time because, because of work. But you know, every time a company would donate or give something, right? Or like do certain work of charity, it's all over social media. Right? Like, look what we did. Look at how the houses that we built. Look at the people that we fed. But what if as Christians, Jesus is calling us, you know what? I want you to give to people, but I don't want you to tell anybody. Nobody should know the generosity that you're doing, the hospitality and the charity that you're doing. It, is ha- it has to be done in the secret. And he says this, Thus when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you. You know back in the day, the, day, the synagogue, in the synagogue, when, when a priest or a, uh, you know, a Sadducee or a Pharisee would give to the needy, because there's people who are in need who would go to the temple, and they would give money you know, to the people. And every time they would give money, they would literally sound a, a trumpet. Like, look how much we gave these people. But Jesus said, don't do that. Sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have, this is important, they have, what, received their reward. What's that reward? What? It's the, essentially, all it is that they're looking for is not the praises of God, it's the praises of people. That's the reward that they're looking for. It's not to be commended by God for what they are doing. It's so that people will see, look how good I am. Look how much we've been giving. And is that true with us? When we do something that the Lord asks us to do, immediately in our mind, oh, how can I show this so that people will see what I do? Because we, we get a hit of dopamine, right? Every time we do something good, it feels good, right? Every time you give, it feels like, oh man, like this is so, I feel so good. And now you want to share it to everybody. And now they're going to like what you did and it feels better, right? There's some sort of an ROI when you do something. But Jesus said, you know what? I don't want any return on investment. I just want you to give without telling anybody what you've done. And this is what Jesus said there. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. For most of us, we would do something with our right hand and post it with our left hand, right? Look how much money I did. Can I take a picture? <laughs> you know, it's so easy to share what we're doing. But as a challenge to his followers, Jesus is pushing us. Keep it a secret. Can you ask your neighbor again, can you keep a secret? Can you keep a secret? <laughs> He's like, no. Everybody, don't, don't tell it to somebody who, uh, who talks a lot. But. So here's the principle of giving. For number one, principle of giving. It is not about what and how much we give. It's about the condition of our heart. It's how we give. We give in secret. Remember, there's a story in, in, in the Bible, again, Jesus was commending this, this, this widow, right, who gave, what, pennies, like small amount, right? But what, what was Jesus looking? She was, he was looking at her heart. Right? It's not about the amount that she gives. It's because she is giving because her heart was open to the kingdom. Whereas the Pharisees, they would give a huge amount and tell everybody about how much they give. But Jesus said, no, look at that widow. Nobody knows what she's going through. Nobody knows if she has, you know, she has rent for the next month. Nobody knows how she's going to feed her children. But she is giving out of the abundance of her heart. And that is what God wants from us. Not the amount. I mean, for some of us, you know, who still are, are struggling through work, it's not what, how much we give. It's, it's the condition of our heart when we give. So keep it in secret, and God will honor that in secret. Second practice, praying. Here's another practice that's core to our following of Jesus, prayer. And, and anybody, everybody here was thinking, oh, prayer is kind of like very, you know, very, very uh, complicated. But can, can I teach you how to pray right now? 
just really quick, this is a practice of prayer. It's just this. Can you breathe in really quick? Deep breath. And then release it and just say thank you. That is praying. To the core of its essence, praying is just inhaling the grace of God and responding back to Him with thanksgiving. And that's the beginning of prayer. That every breath that you breathe, you know that it comes from God. You do not earn the breath. Maybe, you know, we're in Canada, so sooner or later, maybe they'll tax the air. But, <laughs> but, but the idea is that it's free, right? What you breathe in is a gift from God. It's the grace of God. The air that we breathe, we're not paying for it. We don't deserve it. You know, it doesn't come from the government or from our money. We, we, there's nothing that we have to do to inhale the grace of God. And all He asks from us is to respond to Him in thanksgiving, to speak to Him. So every breath that you take, every move you make, <laughs> He's watching you. But, but that is prayer, right? You breathe in God's grace and you exhale the thanksgiving that you have for Him. And that's the beginning of prayer. If we practice that over and over, what it would, what would it would be look like, no? If as Christians, we just have, you know, have this attitude of prayer before God. And that's why we encourage everybody. You know, the way that you practice prayer is you do it more often. Come to church. We just had prayer meeting last Saturday. It was such a blessing, you know, to hear and to have people here praying all together for our nation. We have it on Wednesdays as well. So be here. But for some of us, we think that prayer is this kind of like this badge where, where you know what, those people who, you know, I, I can't really pray because, you know, they, you know, they pray so good. <laughs> You know, such like complicated prayers. I'm like, I don't, it's so long, I'm so intimidated. But that's not how Jesus tells us how to pray. Right? Prayer is not about how good you speak. Right? It's the intentions of your heart. It's how you speak to God. It's how you breathe Him in. Because once we breathe God in, and we acknowledge His grace and what He has done for us in the cross, what can come out? Like, there's nothing but thanksgiving and praise and adoration that's going to come out. And that is what prayer is. It's nothing complicated. It's not, it doesn't have to be sophisticated. In fact, Jesus says, don't, don't overcomplicate your prayers. He says here, and when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues. You know, I've heard people stand on the pulpit and have like crazy prayers. I'm like, I can't pray like that. It makes you intimidated, right? But it says like, do not be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may, again, may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their rewards. When you come in front, your audience is not the people. You have an audience of one. And I heard this once before. It says this, If our public prayers does not sound like the ones we have in private, then we're putting on a show and it yields no power. There are times when I would pray, you know, sometimes we would pray in public and, and I would hear the Spirit says, you don't sound like that when it's just you and me. <laughs> like, who, who's, who's, who's calling or who's talking, right? Is the way that we pray when we're in a group of people the same as we pray when we're one with, one, on one with God? Let our prayers in public just be the overflow of what we do in private. And again, that's what prayer is. Prayer is just being with God, speaking to Him talking to Him. And when you say prayer, it's not just, you know, the things that we utter. It's our time with God. Prayer encompasses everything that we do with God. It's our alone time, our quiet time. Anybody here still practice that? Do we practice time with God alone? Especially in the mornings when it's just you and the Lord. And that's really all what prayer is. It's the time that you spare and that you spend with God where you laugh with God, you talk to Him, you cry together, you, you laugh together, you, you, know, you, just, you just talk to Him, you wrestle. You, you know, sometimes you, you, you're angry at God. Sometimes you, know, you feel happy with Him. It's just a moment where you're just vulnerable and you could speak to God one-on-one. -on -one. That's what prayer is. It's intimacy with the Father. And Jesus says this, but when you pray, Go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. It's that intimacy with Jesus. That's what he's saying. Prayer is not about standing in stage and declaring like very good words. Prayer is being with the Father, speaking to Him one-on-one, -on -one, and it's building that inter in intimacy. I remember my wife, I, I keep asking her, like, what, what, what was your, you know, sometimes we would look back, the kids are sleeping, we're having coffee, it's like 1 a.m., 
And we were like talking like, oh man, day's done again. And you could breathe because the kids are sleeping. And I would ask her this question. I was asking, what do you miss when you were single? Any, any couple here ever talk about that before? Like, what do you miss when, you know, it was just you and, you know, you had no, really, you had no kids. I wasn't around. And I, and I would wish in the back of my head, she would say, oh, no, I, I don't miss anything when I'm single. I was so complete with you. And like, you're perfect. And like, I love her life right now. Like, this is the best that I could ever have. But no, she says this. She said, you know, <laughs> what do you miss? And I was so scared when she was saying, what do you miss when I was single was just, I had so much time with the Lord. I miss the moment, and she said this when she was, because she, she worked uh, somewhere far away where she had, like, you know, family was far. And she said this, I was, I miss the time when I would open my Bible and just spend the rest of the day there. You know, I'd be in a park, or I'd be, like, in my room, and then you just have all the time in the world to be with Jesus. Do we have those moments? Do we miss those moments of intimacy with Jesus? And young people, I'm saying this right now before you have kids. <laughs> Because when you have kids, oh man, like your quiet time will be a little bit more challenging, right? But when you are single and you're on, you know, you have your own room, you know, you have your own towel, you have your, you have your own food. <laughs> when you have this time of like, it's just you, embrace your intimacy with Jesus. Deepen that relationship. Because when things happen, when you start a family, again, it becomes a lot, it, it's, it's definitely a lot more fruitful. And it's, it's, it's a lot more, um, uh, what do you call that? I lost the words because I'm just thinking about the kids and it's kind of crazy. But there's times, you know, when you're when you're when you have kids and you're married, you're having your quiet time. You just you just made your coffee. You're praying with Jesus and you're like you're you're enjoying Him. And suddenly you'd be like, Lord, please, please, you know, please shut shut the devil that's that's knocking on my door. It's like, no, no, that's your kids. <laughs> they're not they're not disturbing you. They're just awake. And I'm like, oh, you know, when when you have and like, kids are great. But what I'm saying is that. There are moments, right, where you have right now with Jesus that you have to treasure. Because there's going to be seasons when you won't have that time anymore. You know, there's going to be seasons where life's going to be busy. You're going to go through sickness. You're going to go through hardship. And it's harder to spend intimate time with Jesus. So if you have it now, cherish it. Be there. And I believe that's, <laughs> maybe it's not, but that's maybe how, why Jesus took so long to be out in ministry because he was just enjoying his intimacy with the Father. It took him 30 years, right? But he was just enjoying that time with Jesus. Can we do that? And it says this here, intimacy requires privacy. Intimacy requires privacy. You cannot have an intimate moment with your loved one without privacy. Married couple with kids, is that true? It's so hard when you have kids and, you, ha and, you, and you're, you want to have intimacy. You have to have privacy, right? And that's why Jesus kept saying here, it says, go into your room and shut the door. Why? Because he wants you and him to be alone. And then can I say this? You know what? In, in, in the most, the part where you can be more intimate with your, with your partner, and for those of you who are married, this is, this is true, I believe, is that the most intimate tar time that you would have with your, with your partner or with your wife and your husband is that when you are just alone together, right? And by the way, in intimacy, that's where, where things are birthed, right? If you're looking for a, a, an answer to your prayer, or if you're looking for, uh, for something to be birthed in your spirit, maybe you need more intimacy with the Lord. Because you cannot have a, there is no such thing as pregnancy without intimacy, right? You have to seclude, and, and over and over again, the Bible keeps saying, and this is the most, um, uh, the, uh, I guess the most uh, symbol or picture that the Bible or the New Testament talks about it when it comes to our relationship with Jesus, is that we are called the bride. The bride of Christ. It's the most intimate relationship that you can have with Jesus. It's being a bride. Right? Why? Because a bride has privacy with her husband. And that's what we're being called as a church, is that do we have that privacy with Jesus? Do we have that privacy with Him still? Do we still value privacy with Jesus? So over and over, this is what prayer looks like. It's intimacy in private. Because there's so much things that God wants to show, show to us when we're in the private place. So seek and fight and really challenge yourself to be in that quiet time with the Lord. 
So principles. Here's what Jesus wants us to, wants to talk about uh, when it comes to prayer. How do we guard our private time with the Lord? Well, number one, find a place. Jesus says there what? Go to your room. Right? Go to your room. And what does that mean? It says that you have to create a space for God to work. And we're saying, like, oh, well, you know, God is, uh, you know, God is everywhere. I can just meet him everywhere. And that's true. God is everywhere, but you're not. God can be everywhere at any time, but you can't. And for some of us, we would think like, oh, my quiet time is in the car when I'm driving, you know, when I'm thinking about other things, my emails, my phone is buzzing. But no, Jesus said, you know what? Find a place. Every time in the Bible, it says, look for that closet, that secret space that you have with the Lord. Maybe it's the washroom, you know, for us who are married. Maybe it's your own room. But you have to create a place for God to meet you. Why? Because it sets our heart up, wherein we say, like, Lord, this space is for you. And when I enter into this space, it's just between you and me. It's very important. We are physical beings, and we need a physical place to remind our spirit that this is sacred. It's just between me and the Lord. And please don't, be, don't make it your bed, <laughs> because that place is very dangerous. You know, a lot of us uh, spend time with the Lord. Lord, am I dreaming or am I talking to you? And <laughs> it's a, so create a, create a place. Go to your room. And second is this. Jesus says, shut your door. In our context right now, the 21st century is this. Shut your phone. Why? Because in the Bible, when Jesus says, shut your room, it just means that do not let others interrupt you in what you have with me. So you close your door so nobody can see you, number one, but number two, so they cannot interrupt what you're doing. But the problem now is our interruption is in our, is in our pockets. Have you ever had time with that where you're with the Lord and something dings or an alarm comes and your phone lights up? Make it a practice that if you are going to meet with the Lord, shut your phone. Trust me, you're not that important. <laughs> Maybe you are. But we're not that important. The things that are looking for here, you know, most of the time, our time with the Lord is being taken away by, by other people, right? And we see it in Jesus' time. There was a time in, in, in the life of Jesus where Jesus goes to a, a secret place, to his place uh, of intimacy. And all of his disciples and all of his, all the people were looking, at, were looking for Jesus. They couldn't find him. And when Jesus came, he's like, where were you? We were all looking for you. You know what Jesus said? He's like, well, this, I'm not, I'm not, this, I'm, I, well, I was in the secret place with God. That's where I'm supposed to be, right? People can wait. Your text can wait. Trust me, they'll forgive you. But the times that we have with Jesus is so important that it should be a priority in our lives, amen? So shut your phone. <laughs> shut our phone. It's really hard. I mean, I know, I know it's very challenging. Sometimes our alarms are our phones. You know, if you could, give your phone a break. When was the last time you turned off your phone? By the way, it's actually healthy for your phone to be to turn on and off too, by the way. Right? It resets your RAM. But anyway, it, turn off your phone at night. Put it to bed. Put it to sleep. Don't pick it up until the day is starting. But for, for the beginning of the day, make your phone off and, meet time, and, and take time for Jesus. And then lastly, pray in secret. That's the principle of prayer, right? The practice of prayer needs to be done more in the secret than it is in the public. And for some of us, the reason we're afraid to speak or to talk or to pray in, in public is because we haven't had that time to pray in God in, in the secret. So look for that secret place, and God will be with you. And lastly, practice number three, where we end, is fasting. And like, oh, fasting. <laughs> we're, we're more used to, as Filipinos, you know, by the way, we have food after this. We're more used to having the E between the F and an A. It's called feasting. We like that a lot. We don't like fasting. I don't know what fasting is. You know, feasting? We eat a lot. Every time we meet, we, there's food. You know, we go to a Filipino church, there's always food. And we eat a lot more. You know, we, we have, I think we eat five times a day. <laughs> only, in, only in our culture. We eat five times a day. But fasting is a key practice. And I probably don't have a lot of principle in, the, in, in fasting, mainly because we don't really practice fasting that much. But has anybody here experienced a fast with the Lord? Have you ever fasted? And by the way, Fasting on social media is not fasting. It's called abstinence. That's different. Fasting means that you are depriving your physical body with food. When I'm going to go on a Facebook fast, it's like, well, it's kind of interesting because when you go on a Facebook fast, you delete your account, but then everybody knows you're fasting because you're not, your account is not there. It's like, well, where's that person? Oh, he's fasting. 
But Jesus said, no, you, you don't, don't tell anybody you're fasting. <laughs> but, right, but again, fasting is not abstinence. Can you say it? Fasting is not abstinence. Abstinence is important, especially if you're going through, you know, if you're addicted to something, abstain from those. But fasting means that you are depriving your, your, your physical body so that your spirit can be more in tune with the Lord. Fasting means that you are not taking food. Why? Right? The reason, the reason it's important for us is that as we deprive ourselves of food, we start to realize that we're not dependent on the things that we put in our bodies. Right? We're more attuned to the things that is inside of us, our hearts, our minds. Things become clearer, and God can start speaking to us. Do you know back in the days, uh, the Christian followers or Jesus, people who were, fa- who were following Jesus used to fast a minimum of two times a week. Twice a week. They usually fast on Wednesdays. And the reason they fast on Wednesdays is to remind themselves that they are not from the world. They would fast in the middle of the week just because why? Because by Wednesday, you're so busy with the affairs of the world. So if you put a stop in the middle of the week on Wednesdays, and these are what, what monks and, and people in the monastery would do, is they would fast on Wednesdays to retune their soul in saying, like, God, I am not dependent on the world. My dependency is on you. And then they would fast again on Fridays before the Sabbath, right? So that they could replenish and they could get ready for what God has for them for the weekend. And I pray for our, you know, for our church and for our practices right now that we have that, si- that same practice wherein we allow ourselves to be hungry of food so, can we, so we can be filled by the Spirit of God. It says here, fasting is this. We fast to seek and submit to God's will. And that's what fasting is. So can I challenge us as a church this year? Can we apply that? And we're like, oh man, I'm so busy. I'm like, next week we're going to do a fast. Next week we don't have food, by the way. We're not gonna <laughs> we're not gonna serve food after this. No, we'll have food after this. But practice that very important um, teaching by Jesus to fast and see what God's going to do. And Jesus says this: and when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their face. You know what they do? Like you know, I'm so hungry. You know, I've been fasting with Jesus. Like you, so, you look miserable. I don't want to be with Jesus if I look like that. <laughs> and so when we're fasting, it says, don't make yourself look. Disfigure. They disfigure their, their faces so that they're fasting so that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. And he says this, But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. When you're going through something, when you're, when you're, when you're wrestling with the Lord, you don't need to let people look, see that, oh man, you look so miserable. And it's not being, you know, it's not being plastic or kind of like pretending. It's just that God's saying, don't let them see what you and I are going through, right? It's just between me and you. And here's just a principle for fasting. I don't have that much. As I said, I think it's not the principle that we need to learn here. It's really the practice of fasting. But really, the principle here is the same as the others. Fast in secret. Fast in secret. I have a white screen there. I don't know why. So again, in, in summary, in summary of these practices, number one, what? Pre- Number one, give in secret. Number two, pray in secret. Number three, fast in secret. It's in the secret that we find these principles wherein power will come. And I was reading through this. It's really hard to do things in secret nowadays, right? Because everything is exposed. Everything is out there, right? You look at your social media. You look at your phone. And by the way, I'm not against any of these. I think they are important. But it's so hard to hide stuff now, right? Everything is there. You know when you, you know, what food you're eating. And then, you know, I know what, where, where you went, where you traveled. And that's great. It takes me to different places, right? But in our, in our life right now where we're so attached to social media, to our phones, to a camera, to a video, there's nothing that we can hide anymore, right? Wrong. There's still something that we do hide. And this is sad because this is the opposite of what Jesus calls us. Do we still hide anything right now in this world where so, we're so open to the media? What we do? Sin. The sinful things. Those are the things that we keep buried in the secret. But it's the opposite, right? What does Jesus say? Jesus says, hide your sins. Oh, sorry, hide, hide your righteousness and confess your sins. But we all have it the opposite way, right? 
we hide our sins and then we post our righteousness. Is that true? What if we, you know, I was thinking about, again, as developers, what if we just make an app where we can just post our sins and our shortcomings? Like, here, here's what Jesus is doing to me right now. Let's call it Instagram. How about that? Okay. We call it AI. Here's my pose. Here's my, here's my issues. Here's what God is doing in me right now. And that's what God is, what God is challenging us to do. Right? It's not to hide or to show our highlights, our highlight reels. And that's good. You know, it's great to share it with friends, with people that we, we care about. But Jesus said, confess your sins to one another. It says here in James verse 5.13 or chapter 5.13, it says what? Confess your sins for, to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. These are the things that we should be talking about. What if the church... What if the people of Jesus, instead of showing how good we are, we show the world the sins that God has saved us from? And we say, you know what? I'm, I was so selfish. You know, this is, what, this is what's going on in my head, but look what God is saving me from. Look what God is doing in my life. I used to be like this, but God is changing me slowly. I yelled at my kids the other day, but this is what God is teaching me. What if we expose ourselves? And I was saying that we post all of the bad stuff that we do. But I'm just saying, confess your sins to one another. And that's what the church is for. That is what our community is for. I remember me, um, and I'm so blessed to have my brothers with me, David and Robin. We have this group in, 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 uh, on Facebook, on, on Messenger, where we, you know, it used to be just a communication group. But right now, it's more of like a, a confession group. Where it's like, where, you know, every now and then, we would post stuff that we're going through. And we would say, I'm not saying, I'm not going to say who posts the most, but Robin would usually say, but <laughs> what, you know, what, what, what we're going, like, brothers, I'm going, like, in detail of what, what's going on in your heart, what's going on in our minds. And if you see that, if you see those messages, you're probably, won't, you're probably not going to like us that much. But the things that are going on in our hearts, and as you expose it to a brother, and they start praying for you, you start getting healed from those sins. And you stop having the power, and you start getting the power to say, you know, I can overcome this because I have a brother who's praying for me. Why? Because if sins that we cover in secret starts to gain power. Did you know that? If you put a sin and you keep it in secret, especially if you already know it's there, and you keep building it up, our, our, um, our washing machine <laughs> has like a little bit of mold. You know, I'm not sure if you ever had a, a washing machine that's like front load. And sometimes you start, you know, if you don't clean it, there's like some parts in there that has a rubber. And, and if, you don't, if you don't wipe it after you wash or after you, you know, after you do your laundry, the, the water that stays there starts becoming mold, right? And you don't notice it in the beginning, but it starts to grow. And then you still see it and you don't take care of it, what's going to happen? It's going to keep growing. And then sooner or later, your laundry is going to smell pretty bad. And people will start smelling, you smell a little bit different. Why? Because there's mold in your laundry and you haven't taken care of it. And that's what sin is. The more that we keep it in secret, the more it grows. And the more it grows, what it becomes, it, beco it, gives, it, it creates a stronghold or a bondage in our life. And that's why Jesus said it's very important that you confess your sin to one another. So that what? So that you may be healed. Could it be that if there's any, any addictions in your life right now or in our lives, you know, pornography, gambling, evil thoughts, things that we are still doing over and over. It's because you haven't confessed it to a brother or sister. Nobody knows about what you're going through. And these are the things that we have to confess. And the word, the, the, the idea of confession is just to me, it just means to put into light. And for some of us who are, you know, Catholic before, we think confession is like a sacrament where, you know, when we go to a priest and he gives us a list of prayers to say, that is not what confession is. Confession is that you go to a brother or a sister and say, I'm going through this. I'm exposing the sin. Because why? You know what? Sin cannot live in the light. Sin cannot live in the light. So if you expose the sin, we think that, oh, you know, I'm going to deal with this sin. How are we going to deal with your sin? I'm just going to put like, you know, like vinegar and like, you know, baking powder and wipe it and Clorox and all these things. That's not how you defeat sin. You defeat sin by exposing it to the light. So if we're dealing with sin right now and it's in the secret, God has encouraged us to practice the practice of confession. 
And we forgot this now in, in our world today. And it's very, very important. So can we do that, church? Can we confess to one another? Think of the people in your lives that you can confess this to. And lastly, as I close, and I'll just ask Mai to, um, to start coming up the worship team, but um, just, just think about this right now. Are there things in the secret that you want to expose to God? Right? Are, there, are there sins that you have to, re- to reveal to God? But there are also, are there things that we are, that we are doing that we are overexposing to the world that God is asking us to keep it as a secret? And why? Because here's, here's, here's how we're, oh, I want to end. It's because there's, there's a reward, friends. Over and over again, three times when Jesus was talking about these practices, he ends with this. It says this, And your Father who sees in secret will what? Will reward you. The reward that we have for doing the things that we do in secret is going to be given by our Father who is in secret. The challenge with the church right now, especially, you know, there's a lot of issues or a lot of um, things going on in the church where, you know, secret sins are being exposed, you know, to like leaders and pastors. When, you know, when they die and they start uncovering the things that, you know, that, that was done in the church. It's like there's so many sins, so many issues, so many scandals that are being exposed to the light. Because all those sins are in secret. And nobody knew about their life until they die and they start uncovering these things. But what if we start doing things in the secret? We start doing righteous things in the secret where nobody knows. And we start exposing the bad things so that everybody knows that things are going on. What if it's the opposite of what we are doing where we keep the good things just to us? And imagine if you die and all of the good things were just in kept, kept in secret and somebody looked at your life and they said, oh man, did you know you know, that, that Pastor Hill, how much, how much money he gave to these people? Did you know that Barl's, you know, how many orf- orphanages he opened? Or how many kids did he feed? Nobody knew about it until he was gone. Why? Because it was kept in secret. Imagine in your deathbed, or in deathbed, or in your obituary, is that what it's called? When people are talking about your life, they're not uncovering secret sins. But they're uncovering righteousness that you've done. Nobody knew about it. But wouldn't that be a life worth living? Where nobody knew about the good things that you did. But it's only God who sees you. And finally, when you go to heaven, and you, you, and you look at God face to face, and, and you give an account for your life, you said, Lord, this is my life. I'm exposed. I, I have nothing to hide, Lord. Everything was exposed. It's all, you know, it's, it's all here. And Jesus would look at you and say, no, 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 no. I kept all the secret things. And he shows you a treasure. And by the way, if you read this chapter uh, in, in Matthew, the next, the next um, topic here was about treasures in heaven. Friends, these secret things, your prayer, your giving, your fasting, these are the treasures that if we do in secret, God's going to keep it. And when you see him in heaven, he'll show you, like, look at this. Look at all the prayers that you did. Look at all the generosity that you've given to people. Nobody knows about it, but I do. Imagine that, that reward when you see him. Not right now, not in the world right now, but it's, it's when we see Jesus and he uncovers all the secret things that we did for him. Wouldn't that be more eternal than the praises of people? Wouldn't that be more important than the likes that we get on Facebook or on Instagram or on YouTube or wherever we are? There's nothing that's going to compare to the amount of followers that you accumulated than the treasure that God will show you when you keep things in the secret. And I like this story. We're going to end with this. It's in Revelation. I'm just going to read it. It's a story about John. You know, in, in Revelation, John was being exposed. God was showing, or Jesus was talking to John one-on-one. And he was showing John secrets and powers and miracles and, and, and really crazy ideas or crazy, um, crazy revelations. And John was writing it down. And in verse 10, this is kind of weird. This kind of baffles me. It says there, then, and John was writing this, it says, Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud with a rainbow above his head. His face was like the sun, and his legs were like pillars of fire. He held in his hand a small scroll, which lay open. He placed his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. And this is where the important part is. It says, Then he cried out in a loud voice, like the roar of a lion, Imagine this, this image 
or this revelation in John's eyes. And when he cried out, the seven thunders sounded their voice. Seven thunders. Imagine that, imagine that picture that John is seeing. And this is what's crazy. It says here, when the seven thunders had spoke, I was about to put it in writing. I was about to post it on Instagram. But I heard a voice from heaven saying, seal up that seven th- seal up what the seven thunders have said and do not write it down. So you're saying that for 2,000 years, God showed John something. Seven thunders spoke to John, but nobody else knew about it. It was just for John. What did they say? What was the things that was, was revealed to John? And Jesus, no, 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 these are not for people. This is just for you. What if the reward that we, well, we can have now for doing things or spending time in the secret is that we get miracles and answers and comfort and healing from Jesus, but it's just for us. Nobody knows about it. What if that's the power that Jesus wants to build in us? And maybe, I'm just thinking, maybe the reason we don't have a lot of miracles right now is because Jesus can't trust us that it's just going to be for us. That right when we receive a healing or a miracle, we want, you know, we want to post it, we want to talk about it. What if Jesus says, can I just trust you in a secret place? Can I just develop something in you right now that's just for you and me? Would that be even, would that be a reward, friends? Would that reward be enough that Jesus wants to just show us something just for me and you? <laughs> Again, I have this other picture here. But there's this, there's this new product that's out right now. It's called the Apple Vision Pro. Have you ever heard of this before? Have you seen this? Anybody wants to buy this? It's, it looks crazy. But essentially all it is is that you put a computer in your face and now you can start doing stuff like, like crazy, you know, Star Trek stuff. But the caveat is this. You look like this. You look like Cyclops. It's like, it's like weird, right? And they're endorsing it so that's saying that, you know, capture everything right now in real time. And you could see it like visually. And they had a post and they have a video of like this guy playing with his kid wearing these goggles so that he can record, you know, their experience, right? So he's like take, like taking a video of the kids so that later he can play it in real time. So he could like see these moments. Like, oh, I want to, you know, I want to like record. And we do it all the time, right? Especially with kids or with moments. You had a great experience. Right away, what happens? We put something in between us and the moment. I'll take a picture. You, there is a barrier between what God wants you to experience and what you are experiencing right now. See, you look silly. Wouldn't it be great if God wants us to experience something and it's just between you and Him? There's nothing involved. We get this with our kids now when, you know, whenever they're doing something that's, that's funny, right away we pick up the phone and we try to take a picture of them. And they stop doing it. Like, I, I, don't, want, like, I don't want to do it again. It's just going to be for you or is it going to be for somebody else? And God is challenging us right now. And if we could all stand and, and just ponder these things, that there are things in our lives right now that Jesus is experience, it's allowing us to experience, but we're so busy trying to expose it. I know there's something in us right now, something that God is doing in our hearts right now that it's just going to be between him and you. And if I can ask you, just close your eyes. Just a moment of privacy with Jesus right now. As we come to him,